So we've already started kind of touching on some of the aspects of holistic development. So this is just going to try and pull it all together. So some kind of core fundamental parts under this theory of holistic development is about recognising that everybody is a unique individual, that we have different aspects of ourself um, and our development, it follows a predictable pattern, but it happens in its own unique way and at different rates. So, for example, even if you take a baby in infancy, even in the first you know, moments of life, we are still unique and showing uniqueness. Thinking about an infant learning to walk, everybody does it in their own way, in their own time frame. There's a predictable pattern of what that might look like, um, but it happens in its own way. You know, some babies, uh, you know, will start crawling, others will start rolling, some will start, like, bum shuffling. You know, other children, you know, they'll start to then pull themselves up. Some children take a little bit longer to take their first steps without holding on than others. You know, that everything happens in a unique way, but under a bigger umbrella of a pattern. Um, so... Many factors will affect this development. We don't exist in isolation. The, and I guess you can put the two main broad categories of nature and nurture, you know, the biological aspects and the environmental aspects. Although, amazingly, like more recent research shows that these two factors are much more inherently connected than, um, than we first would think, you know? So taking the biological factors are genetics, once upon a time, they thought you're kind of born with a set of genetics and that's it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't change. There's nothing you can do. More recent science in um, something called epigenetics shows that actually environmental conditions and certainly in terms of your, like, your parents and your grandparents and how their environmental conditions were will actually affect what parts of your genes will get switched on and off. So it's actually much more kind of interlinked than they first thought that how, you know, what we eat, what we surround ourselves with, our emotional states, uh, you know, our relationships, our connection with other people and other things will actually affect our genetics, you know, which is fascinating. Um, <clears throat> you know, and then um, we've got the bigger, the bigger picture of environmental things. And, you know, there used to be a big argument, didn't there? Which is more important, the biology or the environment? Nature versus nurture. What's the most... I don't think it matters what's most important. The important thing to understand is that they're both important factors and they both influence how a person grows and develops. <coughs> now, we've already kind of talked about this a little bit, but relationships are absolutely fundamental to how humans grow and develop. And particularly in the first couple of years of life, that... Um, that need for attachment is fundamental, not just for physical survival, but also for emotional and social uh, survival. Um, it, uh, if you haven't come across Bowlby, uh, I expect those of you in early years have come across John Bowlby, who studied uh, orphans, I think, after the Second World War. Um, that's where the term kind of attachment came from. And there are two broad categories. You've either got somebody who develops a secure attachment in infancy uh, or somebody who doesn't, an insecure attachment. There are different types of insecure attachment. Um, but how that then affects a person as they grow is quite significant. So people with um, you know, secure attachments are much more likely to form uh, relationships with friends and partners and things in the future in terms of a more kind of solid relationship. They're better able to socialise with other people. They're even more likely um, to go further in education. They're more likely to have like higher paying jobs and enter kind of careers. So it, like he discovered that it influences a person's life progression in terms of what happens in infancy, in terms of relationships. Um, uh, and so again, think about in terms of forest school, sometimes forest school does get used with people who perhaps didn't have secure attachments in, in early life. And uh, we were talking earlier about the importance of us forming a secure at attachment, or if you want to call it that, a, a secure relationship in some way to try and I guess, like, fill the gaps that, of things that they might have missed in, in earlier life. And the other thing to think about is 
you may kind of in books and websites and stuff when you look at holistic development you'll see like different areas of development labeled which we're going to kind of do in a second so you kind of put them into as a society we put things into boxes as a way to communicate and talk about them but the important thing to realize is that they're not separate at all the human brain does not work in isolation you know like we don't have a bit of our brain that just switches on and goes right i'm now socially developing right i turn that off now i'm physically developing i'll switch that bit off now i'm emotionally that doesn't happen um, it happens all at the same time and our brains is a complex web of neural pathways that everything happens simultaneously which is why I put the web as a picture just to remind us that everything is connected and you know if there's one aspect of a person that is lacking for whatever reason that's going to ripple through the web and affect everything else uh, so you know take the example of animal school zebra in animal school he's been bullied yeah the ponies were taking the mick out of him because of the, his stripes so his uh aspects perhaps his emotional social aspects were being negatively impacted by the bullying and he started failing at his academic schoolwork in in the story there so you know it all it's all connected so our conversation earlier about how do we best support individuals in terms of nurture and growth is we need to address everything even if it doesn't seem completely relevant to where we are you know in an in an academic setting maybe somebody's spiritual development doesn't seem relevant in terms of our maths lesson or whatever we're doing but ultimately you know it will have an effect on that person's growth and development um, so in order for us to talk about this we've got our acronym of the, the holistic development is made up of smiles. So I've broken it into six kind of different aspects of a person. And I find the rainbow quite pleasing <laughs> because it can smile. And you know, it's a stripe in a bigger hole, you know, so as a symbol for holistic development. <laughs> I was quite pleased with that. Um, so I'm gonna just run through uh, each of these just in terms of giving you a context of what that means and then we're going to do an exercise where you're going to explore how being in nature kind of supports each of these. So I'm going to start with S for spiritual development. So spiritual not the same as religious just important to kind of just separate that out. Um, so spiritual development being connected to something bigger than yourself um, which some people might find through religion, but not necessarily. You can maybe find it in other things, being part of a community, part of a family. I'm a bit biased, but I suggest being in nature is a very good place to find a spiritual connection because you can't get much bigger than nature and we are all inherently a part of it, regardless of whether we're consciously aware of it or not. So um, it's a fantastic place to start nurturing that. Uh, it also, maybe things like having a sense of purpose in your life might come under uh, spiritual development. Um, a lot of indigenous cultures believe that every human being is born into the world with a unique set of gifts that they're bringing to their village. And it's the role of the village to help the person discover it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't live in a society that necessarily echoes that that message um, but you know everybody has a purpose of why they're here so maybe people need time and support to find that um, it's also maybe also understanding a perspective on our life and kind of just how tiny we are in such a humongous infinite universe like that's like whoa some of the cosmic stuff might come into spiritual development and spiritual understanding um, and, you know, having, having faith and belief. I don't necessarily mean religious faith. I mean, you know, trust in the universe. Again, could be a really powerful thing for people. Because, you know, if you trust the universe, what, what are you going to do to me? <laughs> you know, what are you going to do to me? It's all right. It's, it, it's, it's the universe. I know my purpose. I know what I'm doing. I'm okay. Bring it on! You know? So, spiritual development. 
Moving on to mm for motor or physical development. So this covers the fine motor skills, the gross motor skills, the you know, balancing coordination, physical health um, aspects as well. Um, something that sometimes is missed off of this and I want to draw attention to is the sensory capacity of the human being that comes under the, like, the physical development. You know, our senses are how we perceive the world around us. And, well, some people say that there are five senses. Other people disagree and think there are far more senses that we have. And perhaps as modern-day humans, we don't use our sensory capacities to their fullest. And again, hearing some of the stories from people who visited with indigenous people like the Sans Bushmen and people who still live perhaps in a hunter-gatherer type lifestyle today, they can do things that sound magical, you know, like they sound superhuman, but they're not. They're completely natural. They're using the same sensory uh, capacities that we are all born with. It's just that they've been given the opportunity to use them and nurture them since they were born. Uh, you know, they could do stuff like, you can ask them where the nearest lion is and they'll be able to tell you, like, yeah, two miles, or, well, they don't talk in miles, but, you know, about, you know, X paces that way. And, like, they'll be right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it seems superhuman, but we're all capable of it. And just the reason I believe that senses and sensory development is so important is we perceive our world through our senses, yeah? Like, we can only comprehend what we sense through seeing it, feeling it, smelling it, yeah? It's the gateway to our understanding and our cognition. Like, this is how it's like linked to the cognitive development. So if our sensory awareness is impaired because it hasn't been given the opportunity of being bombarded by real life, then that's going to affect how we understand the world around us. Our whole kind of knowledge base of what reality is, is based on what comes through our senses. And if we have limited sensory capacity, we're going to have a limited understanding of the world. Uh, which I think is hugely significant. So going back to what we were saying yesterday and the dangers of an indoor sedentary life spark style of being you know, in front of a screen and that's all you get, imagine how that would shrink a person's sense of reality and, and understanding of the world because they're not having that dynamic sensory experience out in the real world. Um, so yeah, sensory, a big part of that. Moving on to intellectual cognitive development, which I have just sort of kind of said about perception and aspects. So these are kind of more your thinking skills. You know, you were talking about France having thinking as a subject. Um, you yeah, know, thinking skills. Uh, this was where that fits. But the ability to rationalise, to think logically, to question, to reflect, to try things out, to evaluate and kind of... Uh, what do you call it? Evaluate and like self, self-correct, that kind of thing. Critical thinking, creative thinking, all of the stuff in terms of cognition uh, and problem solving skills. Again, all things that are crucial for us to kind of be in the world. Okay, humans obviously are very, um, very intellectual in this sense, in terms of very cognitive. We're tool users, aren't we? That's kind of how we've evolved as, as a species, working stuff out, solving problems. Um, so it's a big part. But I think perhaps also sometimes this, I'm not saying it's not important, it is obviously very important, but this area of development perhaps has been put on a bigger level of importance than some of the other areas that we're talking about. Uh, I remember Sir Ken Robinson in one of his talks so describing as um, the, the education system thinking that it's all, you know, aiming to create college professors and that college professors think of, um, you know, their bodies just as a vehicle to move their brains around, you know, just to move their consciousness. You know, they, they don't have any other aspects of, of their development. Um, so we want to bring it into balance. It's still very important, but just bring it into balance. <coughs> then linguistic developments. We could talk. We 
we can talk, woohoo! That is pretty amazing that we can talk, you know? Like, just, just think for a moment what's happening right now, right? My brain has an idea, a concept that it wants to share with your brains. And my brain knows that if I move my mouth and vocal cords and make sounds in a certain order, then I'll be able to make words and sentences in the language that we call English. And then, so that's what happens. And these sound waves whoosh, come through the air into your ears and vibrate, you know, your ear stuff going on. Very technical biology there. You know, the vibrations are received. And your brain then like translates that into words and sentences, which hopefully, if I'm doing my job right, conveys the same sort of message that's in my brain. That's pretty cool. That's like awesome. I, whoa, that is a superpower, you know? And I, I think sometimes, oh no, what was that? Superpower, it's a bird. Oh my gosh. Is it still all right? Or is it constant? The bird, it's a bird strike. There's a message for the birds. Maybe it's protesting because it's saying like birds have language. The birds do talk to each other. Like, as in, and they talk about, in fact, if you want to know, what, in fact, one of the superpowers that the Sans Bush people have is bird language. They understand what the birds are saying. That's how they know the lions are two miles away. Like, they understand what the birds are saying to them. I don't necessarily mean like they're talking to them as in, hi, how are you today? But they understand like the alarm calls and the patterns of behavior. And that, and like, you imagine the lion creating a ripple effect, like uh, concentric rings, like a pebble in a pond that ripples out among the landscape and the birds respond to it. And so if you understand what the birds are saying, that's how you know the lion's over there. And you can practice it you know, in, with our bird, any birds, anywhere you can practice in. So maybe that bird had a message yeah, for us. Nice. Yeah. 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 Message from the birds. Yeah, the obvious, <laughs> 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 um, yeah so language is pretty awesome. It's pretty amazing. And, um, you know, so it, it, it includes that kind of complex process like no wonder little toddlers like like Lily Rowe is going through obviously her period of like language acquisition at the moment duck is one of the words all birds are a duck all birds are a duck at the moment but you know so we we acquire language and we don't we don't get taught that explicitly do we we just we hear people talking to us and we pick that up and and the sounds around us we all it kind of informs that and our comprehension and you know there's that gap isn't there again I can see it in Lily Rowe like she understands pretty much everything you say to her but she hasn't yet got the vocabulary to be able to speak it back and so um, I think sometimes there's a tendency to underestimate young children and to sometimes limit knowledge to them um, so you know Lily Rowe will go like duck and it's a blackbird for example. So I try to make sure that I kind of go, yeah, I, I can see it's a bird, like a duck, but it's not a duck. It's, it's a blackbird. It's a blackbird because it's, you know, got black feathers and an orange beak and stuff. And, you know, it's important to do that even with little, little children, because then when her language kind of vocabulary catches up, she'll know it's a blackbird. She'll know it's a blue tit. She'll know it's an owl. She'll be able to speak it. Uh, you know, we don't have to dumb things down for little people. You know, always a birdie. You know, they, they, they're just smaller humans with less life experience. They're not stupid, if you know what I mean. In fact, at that period of, like, peak brain growth, you know, that's the m most, you know, up to three is, like, the most rapid brain growth that you ever have in your life. So in many ways, toddlers are more intelligent than us in terms of like, you know, their, their brain capacity. So um, yes, we uh, don't dumb it down. Um, good, right. <laughs> uh, emotional development. So that's the ability we have both to recognize our own physiology in terms of what emotional state we're experiencing, which some people can't do. Um, particularly if they've come from families that perhaps don't express them 
emotions uh, in an appropriate way. But you know, every emotion has a physiological state. Yeah, our different chemicals are released in the brain and flood the system. So our emotions actually affect our physical health as well. So again, this is connected to our body, physical development. If you haven't come across it before and you're interested in this, Candice Pert was a neuroscientist and back in the 70s she found like the receptor cells in other systems, other parts of the body, the neurotransmitter chemicals that they used to think just functioned in the brain. She found receptor cells in the immune system, the digestive system, the circulatory system. So she basically proved the emotional state affecting the body. And there's a suggestion that a lot of like long-term chronic health issues could be stemming from people's emotional states and basically stuck emotions uh, that aren't kind of released and expressed because that those chemicals kind of stay in the system and, and affect the body. Um, so it's that ability to recognise, you know, I'm getting angry or I'm, you know, frightened or I'm joyful, yeah. Um, and then the ability to express that emotion appropriately. So all, just, just, just a small point, all emotions are valid and natural. They are all okay. There is no such thing as a bad or negative emotion. Okay? We have emotions. We have evolved to have emotions. Therefore, they are evolutionarily necessary, if you believe Darwin. So they have a function. Anger has a function. Fear has a function. Sadness has a function. They are necessary. They are not bad or wrong. Again, we live in a judgmental society that might frown upon that. And perhaps that causes people to bottle them up and to repress them and to not feel them. And perhaps that's why everyone's screwed up <laughs> to, some, to some extent. Well, that might be why we're living through mental health issues. You know, a quarter of adults with anxiety, depression, you know, that's horrendous. You know, maybe it's actually stuck emotions that need to be expressed. However, we do live in a society where certain expressions are perhaps more acceptable than others. So I feel angry. One option is to go hit somebody. Perhaps not so acceptable. But there are other things I could do. I could go for a walk. I could go chop some wood with an axe. That's quite good. You know, I could go do something over there, which is more, more you know, more acceptable. So... Um, yeah, the ability that we have in terms of our emotional literacy to be able to express those things and to behave uh, those things in an appropriate way. Then there's also another side to emotional development, which is actually with other people and recognising other people's emotional states. So I empathise with other things. I can see that somebody's looking a bit down. Maybe they're suffering, you know, with sadness at that moment. So I can kind of read people's body language and... Uh, how they are in themselves and kind of feel it. So empathy, just to bear in mind, is not the same as sympathy. Empathy is you're feeling the same emotion as the other person. In, you're, you're getting down into the <laughs> with them, basically, you know, like um, not just looking at them from above going, oh, I'm really sorry for you with that sympathy. So, and again, According to some of the stories of the indigenous people, because they're so connected to each other, they do, you know, if one person in the tribe is sad, everybody's sad because it kind of ripples out. But then they have healing practices and grief tending practices that help process that for everybody, um, which again, we've kind of lost in our society. Um, and so perhaps uh, in terms of what we do in our society or what we can do if we're good at it is in terms of our own emotional literacy if we notice someone's sad I can control how I then behave and what I say to kind of be modified to other people's emotions so I kind of I'm not just completely clueless and living in a bubble I can see how other people are and that kind of might affect how I then behave um, so, yeah, emotional development, which is very closely linked to social development. So social development is kind of all of that bit that we just talked about in terms of empathy and body language and stuff. But it, it includes also the linguistic aspects of language and communication, too. But it's also some of the other unseen stuff that happens within a community. So, um, you know, there is often people fall into like roles 
uh, with it. You know, think of a friendship group that you're part of. You might have different roles. You know, someone might be particularly known for list their listening skills. Other people might be known for their creativity. Other people might be known for their leadership. Those roles aren't fixed and they're not necessarily consciously designated either. They just sort of happen when you're with that group of people. Um, uh, and it's also the awareness that there might be different things in different groups. So when you're interacting with four-year-olds, the social norms of a group of four-year-olds is different to the social norms of a group of 40-year-olds. You know, there are different kind of customs and practices in those. Again, these are often not consciously thought about. They're just naturally part of the system. Um, and so the, also the relationship forming kind of comes in there as well which we've sort of already touched on because everything overlaps Ooh. and so there you are that's kind of six ways of looking at the different aspects of a person of a human being's development but as we said at the beginning they're all a web they all connect with each other you can't really as i was talking about them you see i couldn't talk about one without kind of connecting them to the others because they're all connected um, so forest school is about trying to nurture that person holistically. And time. That's a nice one to finish on there. Because you know, what other what else is there other than space and time? <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Cool. So if we want to nurture people holistically, if we want them to smile, um, we've got to be out there. We've got to be out there too for a school. <laughs> Uh, I'll let you into a secret as well, right? The reason I did Forest School and not something else, why I'm not doing, you know, I don't know, teaching people to sail boats or uh, like you do, you do, you do a good job at teaching people, you know, in the boats, but um, is because I believe that this thing we call Forest School is the way that we nurture people and bring them into their true self and become authentic human beings that are empowered to go share their gifts with the world. Right? If I thought it was something else, I'd do something different. Like, so the power, the transformative power that a forest school can have on individuals, it's life changing. I know it sounds like I'm being way, but it is, it's life changing completely life changing like some particularly some of the teenagers that have had a rough ride of life you know in their first 15 years you suddenly see it and it's like wow you know and you know that's going to help the world on a bigger level we're all small pebbles in the stream and if we can help each other you know find our gifts then the world will be a different place and not you know fighting each other and crazy that happens you know like it would just we just need everyone to be back out in the woods being nice to each other or at least connecting there we go do you have any thoughts about how forest school supports holistic development do let us know in the comment section below if you've found this video useful do give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our channel so you can join us again in the woods next time or the classroom in this case next time and thank you for watching bye holistic development is made up of smiles all aspects of a person and different learning styles they're all interconnected with no hierarchy and the best place for growth is to head to the trees <laughs>